Welcome back everyone to another episode and in this edition I'm going to be doing a continuation essentially of the last video which was on differential amplifiers. This time we're going to be seeing these diff amps in operational amplifiers and we'll be talking about some of the characteristics, uh, the ideal versus the practical, the real world, some of the electrical characteristics that we're going to see, uh, some unique measurements to op amps, and then we will do some videos in the following experiment. This is a little different than what I usually do in every episode that I've had pretty much up to this point. There's been a, a, a theory and then a demo on a, a breadboarded circuit. Well, this time I think I, there's probably a little bit too much theory to cover and add a experiment, actually four, that I can think of that would need to be done just to do the intro material for, for op amps. So, this one will be the theory portion, and the next one will cover all of the experiments, which prove that the, the data sheet actually doesn't lie to us, and it's uh, some good information. What you see here are, are three different styles, or packages of op amps. Of course, we have the, the this is the, almost the ubiquitous one, uh, the 741 op amp, and this is the one that we'll be doing all of our experiments on. This one is from TI, and you can see it's a... Uh, it's eight pins, uh, one of which isn't used. And so this is a P-dip, and this is a transistor-based device. Then we have a JFET op-amp. This actually has two of them, so this one has a little bit higher input impedance. And I doubt if you can find a whole lot of these anymore. This is a TO-99 package. And the data sheet that I found for it, this is from Harris, which has been purchased by Intersil. This, uh, the data sheet actually goes back to 1979 for this device, but the electrical characteristics of this are pretty much identical to the characteristics in, in this one, which is a, a recent, uh, recent manufacturer. And then, of course, you have the surface mount uh, devices. This one's a, a small gull wing device, and it looks like some of the gull wings have been clipped, so this one's probably junk. And it's like an solder it into the board somehow um, but it'll also have the uh, very similar characteristics to to all of the op amps so we'll talk about those characteristics and uh, how we can use these circuits in some future lectures so we'll talk about these electrical characteristics and then the uses of op amps in in future videos and do some breadboarding on that as well so let's go ahead and get started here you see the standard symbol for an op amp, just a triangle with uh, two inputs. Uh, the negative is the inverting input, the positive is the non-inverting input, and then we have one output. Some of these op amps will have actually two outputs, and if one of these, for example, was a, a sine wave with this direction, the, the electrical characteristics of the other one would be just the opposite or inverted. Now the name operational amplifier actually comes back from the early days of tubes and they were using tube circuits at that time to do some mathematical functions, the operations of integration and differentiation from calculus. And since they were doing these mathematical operations, the amplifier was called a operational amplifier or just op amp for short. Schematics that have a, a little bit more detail would also include connections for the positive and the negative voltages uh, plus VCC and they, it might be called minus VCC or also VEE. So there's no way to tell until you actually find the data sheet. So what the device is designed to do, much like the differential amplifier that we had in the previous video, that if we took two voltages and then compared these, uh, plus uh, one volt and two volts, the output difference would be shown at this point. So it still does the, the work of a, of a differential amplifier, but uh, you'll see shortly that it does quite a few more things as well. 
Now in a perfect world, an ideal op amp would have an infinite input impedance. We'd like to see this look just like an open, and that way that any voltage which, is, which appears on the input sees a, an infinite impedance so the circuit isn't loaded. We would also like to see a voltage gain that is actually infinite. We would, of course, want to be able to set that voltage gain to some practical value. Uh, infinite would be a little bit, uh, well, excessive. And then the output impedance, we'd like that to be zero ohms, ideally. So input, very high impedance, or maximum impedance, infinite impedance. And this prevents circuit loading and assures that all of the voltage at the input actually appears at the, at the, at the amplifiers that are inside of the circuit. We would like to see the output impedance to be zero. We don't want any voltage to be dropped inside of the device. We want all of the voltage to be dropped on the load. And we don't want the output to affect whatever current that we, that we develop. Well, a practical world says that that's just not going to happen. You know, any electrons that come screaming and yelling into this are going to naturally have some kind of impedance that they're going to see. Now, on a typical op amp, uh, and I'm, when I'm saying typical, I'm talking about a, an op amp called the 741. And the 741 goes back about 40 or almost 50 years, if I'm not mistaken. And it's, a, it's pretty standard. It's a general purpose op amp. But its input impedance is, is usually, and varies a little bit by manufacturer, it's about 200,000 uh, ohms. So 200K is the minimum input impedance. Actually, I think it's closer to 300k ohms. And it goes almost, it goes up to about 2 meg. Now, if I had JFET circuitry in here, this impedance could go even higher. The voltage gain. All right, we want it infinite in an ideal model. In the practical model, it's just, uh, just a sad thing, but we're only going to get a gain of about 50,000 in the voltage. So it's really very, very substantial gain. A small signal applied at these inputs is going to be 50,000 times bigger at the output. So it really does have an ex extreme gain. And this 50,000 is usual, is the minimum for a 741. Uh, and again, depending on the manufacturer. Uh, it, can ha it can have gains up to 200,000. And these are, pro these are pretty typical. So if we put, you know, one millivolt on one of these inputs, the output would be 200,000 times bigger, assuming, of course, that we had a power supply that would allow it, allow it to swing that far. And, of course, assuming that the 741 can handle it, which it can't. The output impedance, we want it to be uh, extremely low. We'd like it to be zero, but in the real world, it's just not going to happen. Uh, we, even the lead resistance that's in here is going to cause some kind of a, a you know voltage drop. And we also have the components. Now, the best one of the best things that uh, they can do is use a push-pull configuration for the output here to give the Z out value something on the order of just a few, you know, a single-digit ohms of value. So in the real world, what we have is uh, we have hundreds of K of input impedance and greater. We have voltage gains of, of 20 to 50,000, uh, depending on the manufacturer, 20K to 50K for the 741. And also the series that the manufacturer makes, mil spec versus civilian spec. And our impedance out is usually in, you know, the single digit ohms. So let's, you know, you just say 1 to 20 ohms or so. And the 20 ohms is probably a little bit high for a Z out value. So this is pretty typical of, of what you would see in a 741. Now, to get this circuit to function and do all of these things doesn't take a whole lot of parts. It only takes uh, three, two resistors and of course hook up to the power supply to do all of this magic. If we tried to do the same kind of thing with uh, with transistors, you can imagine the circuit is quite a bit bigger. So these things are, are a big improvement on, on what we were dealing with in the earlier lectures. Here's a simplified block diagram of what the inside of an op amp would, would contain.
and we have two types we have one that's going to be working with BJT's and the other one working with with FETs the the principal difference between these is the input impedance with the FET we'll be able to get several hundred K of resistance quite easily and we can get higher depending on how it's made how it's designed with the FET because it's inherently high input impedance uh, because the reverse bias gate to source we can get on the order of several meg ohms of input impedance so in our BJT we have the two inputs the inverting and the non-inverting and the difference from the output of this transistor pair is input to our amplifier and this is where most of the components actually lie the 741 that we're going to be dealing with I believe has around 30 some odd components on the inside of it most of those are transistors and they would be located in here and then the output is a push-pull stage so a positive or negative voltage that's applied to these inputs can come out of the circuit and this would also be a an AC waveform so it'll be able to generate both the positive side and the negative side because of the configuration of the push-pull amp and because we're going taking our output off of a forward biased emitter the resistance is always going to be quite low and in our FET op amp same thing applies we have a negative we have a positive the difference that's generated by those voltages through these FETs is applied to our amplifier the amplifier magnifies the signal and applies it to a push-pull amp and once again we get our output so again the only difference is the FET will have a much higher input impedance than the BJT uh, but in general they're, they're very much the same on the amplification uh, that you can get out of one of these op amp devices it's going to be applicable to both AC and DC so if I had a op amp let's say it had a gain of 10 and I applied a 1 volt peak signal uh, with our gain of 10 I would have 10 volts peak out if I applied 1 volt DC I would also get after amplifying it 10 times I would get 10 volts DC this is true because there's only a single capacitor that's in most of these op amps or very few and none of them are in series between the input and the output so we can get both a AC voltage and a DC voltage if we had that cap in series we obviously wouldn't get a, a DC amplified DC voltage out so the op amp will, will amplify both the AC and the DC just as well well, let's put some voltages onto our inputs and see what we get as an output uh, just as a as a voltage potential whether it's positive or negative we're not going to worry about the magnitude at this time if I put 5 volts on the input of this op amp uh, the non-inverting input I'm obviously going to have 0 volts on the inverting input because it's attached to ground and the way I would uh, look at this is is the 5 volts more positive than it than the zero volts on the inverting input and the answer is yes so five the signs match this five volts is more positive this zero is more negative than this so the output is going to be a positive voltage if I were to apply a negative five volts to this circuit now the negative five is not more positive than zero and the output would actually swing to a negative uh, this seems relatively self-explanatory when we're dealing with just 0 and, and minus 5 on a non-inverting device you wouldn't expect any inversion well it's a good to kind of get the idea on this because when we get to the double-ended device it can lead to a little bit of confusion let's try the same thing with the inverting input being 5 volts and now the non-inverting is grounded so it's 0 volts now the signals obviously don't match. Zero is not more positive than positive five volts and the output goes negative. It's been inverted. If I make this minus five, now the signals match. Zero is more positive than minus five and the output goes positive. So everything is fine. We don't have any any trouble. So in an inverter you get the inverted signal. Non-inverting input you get a non-inverted output.
when we get to the double-ended differential, things can get a little bit more, more confusing. And again, let's use some DC voltages. So let's put another circuit out here, or another op-amp. And plus and minus here. And you notice that I'll always put uh, plus on the bottom and minus on the top. You can see these actually flipped around on some schematics or on some designs. It really doesn't matter. But it seems that more often than not, they put the non-inverting input on the, on the bottom. Just, just a little info on that. All right. So if we apply one volt here and two volts on this input, two is more positive than one, so the output becomes positive. If I make this minus two volts, now the signs don't match. Minus two is not more positive than one, and the output goes negative. What happens if both are equal? Well actually now it's considered a non-inverting amp again so every but because it's the same signal it's going to be zero but it is considered a non-inverting amp. So you can see that in double-ended mode this is where this uh, comparing the signs of the inputs to get the polarity of the outputs is kind of handy. So if the signs match then the output is positive. If the signs don't match, the output is negative. And then, of course, the last one, we have common mode. And this would be, again, I think I used the example in the last video. If I had uh, 50 hertz uh, common mode signal, uh, which would be common in Europe from the AC mains, and 60 hertz in the U.S. from the AC mains, we would expect that 60 hertz signal to be present on both the inverting and the non-inverting input and we would expect no output voltage uh, that's generated by those two frequencies or the the voltage associated with those two frequencies at the output so if it was uh, 60 hertz one millivolt here and 60 hertz one millivolt here we shouldn't get anything at the output and so this is common mode and this is common mode rejection we want this to be absolutely absolutely zero. So let's take a look at the 741 in a little bit more detail. Seen here is a slightly more detailed schematic symbol for the op amp and this would be just a typical op amp so you can see that it has a an inverting input and a non-inverting input. It has the offset nulls and then of course VCC the positive supply voltage VEE the negative supply voltage and a single output and once again some op amps do have dual outputs and they are the complements of one another so if one is putting out some positive voltage let's say positive one volt the other one's probably putting out negative one volt the purpose for the offset null is to zero out any of the the bias variations that you would see or that are generated by the inside of the of the op amp Ideally, if you have zero volts applied to each one of the inputs, or both inputs are grounded, you're working in common mode and you should have no output whatsoever. However, because of the imperfections, this doesn't happen very often, so they have included, very kindly, some offset nulls. The way you would use these is apply a potentiometer between the inputs, so uh, offset null 1, and offset null 2 and we apply our potentiometer between these two points and then we make an adjustment through the uh, center leg which is connected to VEE and by adjusting this output or this input we actually get the the outputs here to zero out and what you want to do is you want to wait till the actual circuit is, is gotten up to temperature so that the uh, offset null is set at the at the point where you're going to run the circuit under normal conditions. Also, the VCC values and VEE values, if VCC were positive 18 volts, this would be called the rail of the op amp. And if this were negative 18 volts, this is the negative rail. So we have a negative rail and a positive rail. Any op amp that can go from rail to rail, 
is capable on its output of going all the way to whatever the values of VCC and VEE are. So if we have an 18 volt positive rail and a 18 volt negative rail, the rail to rail voltage or an op amp that can go from rail to rail would be able to go to positive 18 and down to negative 18. And this isn't true of all op amps. The 741 is an absolute exception to this. As a rule, it should be able to with a 15 volt supply. So let's mark these out and just put 15 volts and minus 15. As a rule, a 741 should be able to go to about 14 volts on the output. So plus 14 to, to minus 14 at these outputs. And that's typical, and the minimum is 13 volts. Uh, I use a, just a general rule of thumb that I think about it as, well, if I have 15 vo or whatever voltage I have here, I just take 10% of that, subtract it from the voltage, and, and, under, and I think optimistically I should be able to get that voltage out. So using that simplified rule, 15 volts, 10% of that it would be 1.5 volts, and 1.5 15 so I would expect 13.5 and this gives me a little bit more uh, security in that the output is going to be reached so um, whatever you choose to use a uh, data sheet is always the best of course this is a actual pinout for a 741 op amp and you can see the offset null is on pin 1 our inverting amp is, uh, input is on pin 2 non inverting on 3 our negative supply voltage is pin 4 and our positive supply is on pin 7 pin 8 has no connection on it it's not needed uh, again in some op amps this might be used as a as the other output uh, pin 6 is an output and pin 5 is the offset null this is the typical pin out for a 741 op amp that is a 8 pin p dip one issue that all op amps have is something called the slew rate limitation. Slew rate is a change in a voltage over a given period of time. So if we had this waveform on an oscilloscope, we would obviously have the change in time in this direction and the change in voltage in this direction. In the op amp, on the data sheets, they're always going to give a value. Uh, it's usually lift, listed as uh, volts per microsecond or, or volts per millisecond. It's, it gives you the rate that the op amp can react to a change of the input waveform. If we have a sine wave whose amplitude is too high, so we have a sine wave and its voltage or its amplitude is too high or its frequency is too fast the op amp may not be able to keep up with how fast the wave is changing and in a sine wave if you remember that you generally get half the voltage in the in the first 30 degrees of the waveform so there's a really rapid change as we go from 0 up to 30 degrees and from 150 down to 180 degrees. And if, if we wanted to plug that in, let's say that we had 10 volts uh, peak for our signal. And we wanted to know what voltage we had at 30 degrees. We would take the sine of 30 degrees times the 10 volts and you can see that we get 5 volts so 5 volts at 30 degrees a really rapid change so it's really slow actually from 130 up or from 30 up to 90 and from 90 back down to 150 really rapid changes so if the when the op amp starts to feel its slew rate limitations the, the voltage is changing faster than it can react to, it's going to initially do so right at this point. Now if we did the same thing with a square wave, all bets are off. The really rapid rise times of these square waves make it impossible for the op amp to reproduce a perfect square wave. So again, we were limited by that volts per microsecond change.
and with with the with the sine wave if we get that frequency high enough we actually end up with a triangle wave and the amplitude is going to be substantially smaller than the original sine wave and in a square wave we might reach that amplitude of the original square wave but it's going to be extremely cut off at the at the front and the back of the of the wave so it's not going to resemble what it started out at, at all one way to determine if a signal that you have is going to exceed the slew rate it's a simple calculation we just take 2 pi times the voltage peak times the frequency and then we divide it by 1 meg and we divide it by 1 meg so we can get the answer in volts per microsecond I, don't, I haven't seen this in any books but the 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 extrapolation is, is, is pretty straightforward. So if we took an example, let's say that we had a frequency of, of 10 kHz and our voltage peak was 5 volts, would this exceed the slew rate? Now 741, it, its slew rate is about 500 millivolts per microsecond. Well it isn't about, it's supposed to be at least that. So if we again plug the values in, 2 times times 10 kHz times our 5 volts, and then we divide this by 1 meg, and you can see that the change is 314 millivolts per microsecond, so we can apply a signal of, of this voltage and this frequency to our 741 and and get a good output so we had 314 millivolts per microsecond and since the data sheet says that we have 500 millivolts per microsecond we're good to go this is just a quick way of, of telling if your signal is actually going to be uh, reproducible with any kind of fidelity on on the output so now let's go ahead and take a look at the data sheet this is a data sheet for a 741 op amp. Good place to start since we'll be using this in our in our experiments. And you can see VCC or the supply voltage for the micro alpha 741C is minus 18 volts for VEE and 18 volts for VCC. And I think they got the the temperature in there in the for the wrong reason it's not supposed to be there and the differential input voltage this is the inputs that can be applied to the inverting and the non-inverting inputs the maximum difference between those two points so minus 15 to plus 15 so when you are operating this circuit we can have up to 18 volts on our supplies but the maximum difference between these two can be no more than plus 15 and minus 15. So minus 15 and plus 15. So you exceed those and all the all the bets are off. You can see that many of the temperatures are just they're not applicable because they just we don't uh, have to worry about them for the device but we do want to make sure that we never exceed the the temperature for the actual leads on the on the IC by more than 260 degrees probably because we will melt all the solder on there and the operating temperature is up to 150 degrees centigrade but the storage temperature is minus 65 to plus 150 now these are maximum values up here uh, and what the actual company recommendation is that you operate it at a maximum value of 15 volts but a, no less than 5 volts and this is true of course for the positive and the negative rails and that also the operating temperature in open air doesn't exceed uh, 70 degrees centigrade so pretty straightforward so far here are the electrical characteristics of a 741 and you can see the first value listed is the input offset voltage and the on the inputs of our op amp ideally we'd like to see zero volts on both of these but because there's always going to be a slight mismatch between the base emitter connection on our differential pair on the input of the transistor we're going to get a really small voltage in here and we would like that voltage to be to equalize to be zero however that voltage it, it can it can be 
something on the order of as much as six millivolts. So we can really have a six millivolt difference between these two pins. And one way we can measure this is actually put a resistor on these and then ground this, measure the voltage on those, and the difference in these two would be our, our offset voltage. If we want to adjust this out, we would use the offset adjustments, and it can take that, make an adjustment of plus or minus 15 millivolts to the output. So it can zero this out by applying a little bit of a adjustment on those offsets. Now the input offset current is the difference between the currents on our two inputs. So again, ideally we'd like these base emitters and all the betas and all etc to be exactly equal, but there can be a difference in the current that's going through one of the differential uh, transistors compared to the other one in the differential pair. So if we had a 100 nanoamps value on one and 200 nanoamps on the other one, our input offset current would be 100 nanoamps. And you can see here it's typically anything between 20 nano and, and 200 nano. The input bias current is actually the average of these two input currents. So using the same 100 nanoamps and 200 nanoamps, the bias current would be 100 nanoamps plus 200 nanoamps divided by 2. So our bias current would be 150 nanoamps. So pretty pretty self-explanatory there too. Next we come to the common mode input voltage range and this is the these are the voltages that would be effectively rejected by the op amp if they were equal up to a, a maximum value. So the input rejection works well up to plus or minus 13 volts. And after that, you know, all bets are off. The maximum output voltage swing, that's going to be dependent on the value of our load resistor. But you'll notice that if we apply the, the values that they wanted to us uh, on, the, on the data sheet earlier, remember it was 15, 15 volts for the, for the typical supply values, plus and minus, that with these plus and minus 15 volts, your typical swing is going to be plus or minus 14. So you're going to get a little bit less than the full uh, supply voltage. So this op amp, the 741, does not go from rail to rail. It's actually a little bit short. I use a general rule of thumb in, the, in, in that I say it's usually about 10% less than whatever the supply voltage is. So in this case, uh, 15 volts, 10% of that would be 1.5. So I, I would expect 13 and a half volts. And it's just a, a little rule of thumb that I use. Unless, of course, I'm using a specific op amp that will actually go from, from one rail to the next. This data sheet gives the voltage gain in a little bit different fashion than what, we, what I'm used to seeing. In that, you know, normally we'd just see an AV, so it would be an AV of, uh, it would say 50,000 or, or some such, so we'd have an AV of 50k. In this data sheet, they actually give it volts per millivolt. So as a, as an example, this op amp, as a minimum, for every millivolt applied, would change. 20 volts, which would give us an AV of 20K. So our 741C should have a minimum gain of 20,000. It just didn't list it in this one. It gave it as a specification. However, the typical gain for this is 200 volts per millivolt or 200 for the AV. So that's the typical value and this is what we can expect. So you can see that this is an extremely extremely large amount of amplification, much larger than we would actually get with a with just a, a couple of transistors. So a really big uh, amount of amplification from the device. Output resistance is going to be on the order of 75 ohms typical on, on the device and the input resistance or input impedance is going to be no less than 300k so here's our our input resistance 300k and it's going to be typically 2 meg and again if we had a FET device this would be quite a bit higher 
and our output resistance uh, is going to be no more than 75 ohms or typically is 75 ohms so not the lowest we can get but it's pretty good input capacitance 1.4 puff so it's really low input capacitance and here's our common mode rejection so the ability of this op amp to reject identical signals on both inputs is typically 90 decibels so this is really really something good and if we follow it further down the next important point uh, short circuit output current so this will actually uh, limit itself at plus or minus 40 milliamps supply current is going to be so the energy that the that the device actually uses is only going to be about 2.8 milliamps maximum not not very much at all and the just power dissipation is going to be 85 milliwatts or less it's a little bit high for power consumption but the op amp still works and you got to remember it's been around for 50 years so the state of the art has increased or improved and well the 741 hasn't that much it's still the same well we just saw that the gain of this circuit is anywhere between 20,000 minimum and a typical value of 200,000 but it's obvious that that frequency or that amplification can't be maintained as the frequency goes up there's a there's got to be a, a cutoff point and that's shown in these AC characteristics charts and the one of interest is is this one you can see that as we go up at, at 10 hertz 100 hertz and 1k even at this point the gain of the circuit begins to drop substantially so we're we're way up at our 200k over here and this chart is given in decibels which is unfortunate I'd rather have seen it given in AV uh, nice logarithmic charts so you can see that as long as we're below about uh, six or eight Hertz the gain is going to be really high but you can expect it's going to drop off as the frequency goes up until eventually we get to no gain at all right around uh, one meg and that's assume making the assumptions that we have a VCC of plus or minus 15 uh, plus 15 and minus 15 and our uh, output voltages is 10 volts with 2k etc but you can see the uh, the drop off that we can get with a with this circuit and this is for an open loop circuit an open loop circuit is one in which there's no feedback and we can actually improve this graph quite a bit by starting to use feedback of course we're going to limit the gain but we're going to improve the frequency uh, bandwidth that we can get out of the device and uh, and we'll get to take a look at that and in, in, in some future videos you can also see that the common mode rejection suffers as the frequency goes up so we have really good common ro mode rejection right up to about 120 Hertz or so it's at full 90 DB and after that it starts to go down quite a bit however the the IC is still rated for that 90 DB and the final items of interest for our data sheet are uh, rise time and the slew rate at unity gain so the slew rate we've talked about a little bit already and we know that if we're taking a a waveform such as a sine wave or a or square wave the op amp can't react quickly enough to changes in the voltage or the frequency to get a, a good output and the slew rate is normally given in volts per microsecond or volts per millisecond so we can see that it's 500 millivolts per microsecond and you can also see a, a rise time value well the rise time value if you remember from AC when you measure a wave you measure rise time between the 10 percent point and the 90 percent point and the data sheet for this op amp says that that rise time from this point to this point should take no more than 0.3 microseconds so it's extremely fast rate of change and if it's a square wave there might be a little bit of an overshoot but it's not going to be more than 5% of whatever the the value is so if we're going up here so 5% something like that a little ringing thrown in for good measure well that's the basic theory on op amps so now we know that they have a good voltage gain they have a very high input impedance they have a low output impedance they are limited by the 
ability of the internal components to change rapidly, so they're limited by the by the slew rate. We can't exceed the voltage difference between any two pins on the op amp at the inputs by too much. Uh, we definitely can't go over apply more than the supply voltages, so we can't apply 16 volts here and 16 volts here. That would damage the IC. And we also now know that, well, if we have 15 volts applied, we're probably not going to get more than, according to our data sheet, about 14 volts. And of course the op amp is also frequency limited and the gain is going to go down as the frequency goes up and that's because of well, Miller effect and capacitances and all, all those other wonderful things. So in the next couple of videos, or in the next video, we're actually going to test all of these values. The slew rate, the uh, voltage offset uh, values, the input offset values, and the common mode rejection. So I hope to see you then and thank you again for watching.